two. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast where we round out the end of the month with another update with good friend Andy Sheckman, uh, founder of Miles Franklin with over 30 plus years of financial and precious metal experience in a family run business of which uh, Miles Franklin, as you know, is an affiliate sponsor and partner with us on this channel. And we're honored to have him as we're going to get his uh, updates on the latest financial situation, where we stand geopolitically and economically. Again, if you are new to the channel, please do like and subscribe and share as it helps the channel grow. And if you are watching, please do click on the notifications so that you don't miss a single podcast. Andy, brother, always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. Johnny, thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, uh, likewise. It's good to be back. And uh, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure. So I, uh, I dug out of the vault with our team here to try to continue to ask you some meaty questions. Um, let's start at the top here. So I, I noticed this morning, Andy, you probably noticed too, Fox News is reporting the Fed is going to do four rate cuts next year and only one this year, which I'm not sure I buy. I still feel like they're going to sneak a second one in there this year. What are your thoughts on that? And what implications does that have for the economy short and long term? I don't believe anything they say. You know, they started, you know, go back to 2008 when Bernanke told us the subprime crisis was contained. Look at everything that they've told us already. They told us that there was no inflation and then it was only transitory and then it actually became structural, but then they had it under control and then it started to rear its head again. And then they were going to make for sure four or five rate cuts. And now it may be one at the end, which to me screams political, right? The last, you know, you do this in, in, uh, September, October, November type frame, September, I think is when they would do it. Um, you, you know, you're looking at that being wholly political. Um, and, and look, quite frankly, I might be one of the few people who believe that they're not going to, or they can't. Look, maybe they can tweak um, like 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 uh, the Royal Bank of Canada did, lowering uh, interest rates by, you know, quarter, quarter percent or 25 basis points. But which is nothing. It's it's spitting in a swimming pool. It does no good. Mm. But the same thing is is true here. Even if the 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 budget was balanced, which it's not. But you know when you talk about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions, and a trillion dollars every hundred days being added to our debt burden, but those those things that I just mentioned alone amount to over 150 trillion dollars. And a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. When you start to lower, mm. to rescue a system that is sick um, because of the suppression of interest rates and all the money and, and all the, 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 the markets and, and banks that are over leveraged and undercapitalized, you lower rates, you've signaled to the world that you will never, never normalize your balance sheet. You will always choose inflation over austerity. And it's it's really the death knell. But ask yourself, who's going to pay for those things? How do we continue to sell treasuries when, when many of the countries that we're financing are spending addiction, China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the India, these countries who have been shedding treasuries, who's going to pay for or who's going to buy our treasuries to finance our our, our spending habit and our debt accumulation if we can if we if we start to pull back on rates and look they they can't control the back end of the treasury market but look I don't think that it's anything substantive at all mm -hmm. and quite frankly I think at this point if they do um when keep in mind there's still 150 basis of points one you know they're, they're 150 basis points or over twice if their target's 2% and they're at 3.5% inflation right now, which we all know is fugazi because the numbers that they give us are, are are manipulated and massaged. And just like in April, they pulled coffee out of the CPI because it was up 80% in the, in the last year. The numbers that they're telling us, even if we believe them, we're, you know, we're, we're, 60% away from where they want to be. It, it, it's how can they pivot? How can they lower rates? They can't. So I, I don't put any stock in it at all. I think it, it it will only exacerbate the problem, reignite inflation, which will only make things worse. And if they do, I think it just reeks of being political into this, this next election. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The timing is way too suspect around the election. And, and I'm with you. I don't believe a thing they say. They always do bait and switches. 
it's it's pretty much the opposite of whatever they say, right? So it's a good signal to our audiences to just know whatever they're saying, go the opposite way and continue yeah. to position yourselves. Um, so the next one would be, Andy, is we've talked about this before, but I, I see it being a repetitive pattern, which is in respect to, I'm going to read this article. It's from Bloomberg, came out this morning. Uh, yen is under pressure even as Japan steps up its verbal warnings. Uh, the yen remained under pressure even after Japan's top currency official warned that authorities stand ready to intervene in currency markets 24 hours a day if necessary. Quote, if there are excessive currency fluctuations, it has a negative impact on the national economy. This is according to Vice um, Finance Minister Masoto Kanda. In the event of excessive moves based on speculation, we are prepared to take appropriate action. So my question to you, Andy, is what implications does that have for both the dollar as well as Japan going into the safety of the BRICS? Well, I don't know about Japan going into the BRICS. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I mean, many of the countries in, in you know, the Eurasian continent are moving in that direction. But what it, it certainly signals for Japan is that they're in trouble. Their currency is in big trouble. And, and this is part of the reason why you're seeing strength in the bond market. These countries, or Japan in particular, big money there would, if if they were smart, they would be selling yen and buying treasuries, paying a, a, a yield in a currency that's moving the other direction. Uh, it, it's this, you know, what used to be the carry trade. I think now it's almost a life raft where these the, these the big money in Japan realizes that they're hanging on to a sinking ship, and so you will see. I think as it pertains to the dollar, um, every incentive for Japan to keep our rates higher by, or excuse me, by keep our rates lower by buying bonds, which will, you know, strengthen the bond market and do the dirty work for, for the Fed. Um, but how long can that last? They're hanging on by a thread. They're at, they're at, I don't know, very close to all time lows against the dollar. And I'm sure many of these the big money in, in Japan would be selling Yen and buying dollars and buying treasuries, which uh, you know will give them a life raft. It will it will certainly help out the Fed temporarily, and um, but it's not a long term solution. I think the yen is in big trouble. Japan is in big trouble. They have a very very uh, um, aging economy, and and the majority mm -hmm. of all of the treasuries and and all of the stocks are owned by the Bank of Japan. This is not a recipe for success. It seems to me similar to one that a path that we are on where. You know, ultimately, you'll have the Fed being the, the the buyer of last resort, where the rest of the world sees what's happening to us, just like we see what's happening in Japan, an aging an aging populace, um, a, a a you know a, a over leveraged system where mm -hmm. the central bank is buying all of the assets. That sounds familiar. They're just a couple of steps ahead of us. So ultimately, it does do a little bit of the dirty work for Powell, uh, and I think ultimately spells a good deal of trouble for. Um, for Japan, and, and I don't care that they stand ready to intervene. That's what they've been doing forever. At some point, market dynamics, mother nature takes over, and manipulations always end poorly, especially ones that are this late in the game. Um, they have real, really, they don't have very, very many options or alternatives other than to come in and continue doing what they're doing, and that is to... Um, you know, to be bailed out by the Bank of Japan, not not a recipe for long term success. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like you said, it's just a matter of time. It's a ticking time bomb at this point. Um, Andy, staying on the BRICS subject, one of our subscribers, we always like to give credit where credit is due. One of our subscribers on Rumble goes by the handle of AZ Marie wanted me to ask you this question. And it is the following. Can you talk about uh, the BRICS proposing a common trade currency unit? Could the CTCU be a way for all countries uh, all countries' currencies, rather, to become gold-backed. Yeah, and and by the way, I just wanted to mention, and I'll answer it, but just so you know what's happening there with the yen, it just dawned on me. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last six months, an ounce of gold in Japan has gone from 200, 290,000 yen to 367,000 yen. Mm. It's a 75,000 yen increase to buy one ounce of gold, and this is what happens when the central bank monetizes the debt and buys everything in sight to maintain that illusion. But right. as far as that question is concerned, it's a big one. And this has been something that we've been talking about for a very long time. Uh, the ultimate, the ultimate 
currency, if you will, that is moving to replace um, you know, this, this common settlement currency that everyone's been talking about for quite some time, um, it, it's coming to fruition. And I just have a note here. Let me find it real quick. Sure, no problem. But there is a, there was a meeting. There were a few meetings that happened just a couple of weeks ago. And the, mm -hmm. the big one was in St. Petersburg. And in the meeting in St. Petersburg, let me see if I can pull it up here. Pardon me for a moment. No problem. While, um, while you're looking that up, Andy, I'm just going to add something real quick while you're doing that. Um, it's interesting that you said that about the the cost of the yen increase, uh, you know, to get gold, because Jim Willie, I know somebody you also respect as well, had mentioned that secretly they're backing their currency in gold and dumping the uh, the treasury bond market, which you pointed on our last show which would make sense with what you just said, because it's a 22% decrease in their yen, which would be substituted by the gold. So that seems to line up. Right. And so, so there were a couple of meetings and the mm. first one was in St. Petersburg and, you know, in it, you had um, Putin come out and, and he said, the Bretton Woods monetary system is dead and gone. And the current one is based only on confidence in the United States. And he said, there is no other guarantee other than to say the confidence in the US economy. And this is something we've talked about quite a bit where, um, you know, weaponizing the dollar doesn't inspire much uh, confidence at all mm -hmm. uh, in the um, in the United States as, as a place to safely park your money whatsoever. And so there was a meeting then just after, and it was in Novograd. It was, was, this was last week, two weeks ago. What's interesting about the meeting in Novograd is that it coincided with the um, G7 meeting where you had the crown prince turn down an invitation to join the G7 meeting. And at the same time, he sent his finance ministers to the BRICS meeting in, in Novograd, where mm -hmm. there were 21,000 people attending from 139 nations, where $80 billion in bilateral deals were, you see that? I see that. I, I got to stop with my hands. I think <laughs> I, I'm the one doing that. I think, I, I think I'm doing that. Anyways, that was kind of throwing me off. But anyways, there are $80, $80 billion in bilateral deals. And what came out of that were 59 nations as well that have committed to joining the BRICS. But those bilateral deals are settled in other currencies, um, in local currencies. Anyways, you had a comment that the BRICS new payment structure is actively being pursued through the new development bank. But what we then saw was a meeting between the president of the BRICS New Development Bank and Putin, where they came out and said, indeed, we've been discussing a new payment structure, and it's called the unit. And the unit, according to confirmed by the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, will be a, a, a common settlement currency using the project Embridge, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about in a moment. Sure. That will be 60% baskets of local currencies involved and 40% in gold. Now, Sergey Glazyev, the architect of all this, has told us for quite some time, John, that this indeed would be the case, that, that they would have a basket of local currencies and a basket of commodities. But it's become very evident that they've chosen gold, solely gold, instead of a basket of commodities, which has too much variability. And it makes sense when you realize that gold is the only other tier one reserve asset as um, reclassified by the Bank of International Settlements in 2019. And if you see the massive amount of, of gold accumulation, like India buying one and a half times the amount of gold the first four months of this year than they did in all of last year, and repatriating 100 metric tons from the Bank of India, quietly at the same time. This is a very big deal because you know what it what it signals to me 
is not only massive accumulation, but repatriation is a very big deal. That repatriation signals no trust, lack of trust. And at the same time, we have India repatriating 100 metric tons from, from the Bank of England, which is, in essence, the London Bullion Market Association. Just a few weeks ago, we reported how Saudi Arabia and Egypt and a half a dozen African countries repatriated all of their gold from the New York Fed, which is, in essence, the COMEX market. So when you realize that they are coming out and publicly saying and getting admission from the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, that they will indeed have this common settlement currency using Project Embridge. Basically, what they're in, what they are saying is that all of these countries will get to keep their own local currency, and and they will be able to trade in their local currencies with one another. This is what we've been seeing all along. So there won't be a common currency for the BRICS, but a common settlement currency. In other words. What you will see will be countries like, for example, we've seen two trades on Project Embridge in 2023, test trades, which was a, a joint deal between China, Hong Kong, United Arab Emirates, and Singapore, I believe. And the first trade in 2023 was using digital yuan cross-border payment using Project Embridge, sidestepping SWIFT, and purchasing oil from the United Arab Emirates. Shortly thereafter, they did another trade using digital yuan, buying gold, using cross-border payment on the Embridge side, stepping swift. And I think these things have been remonetized, and and we can see that. You know, you see Iran awarding the this massive contract to to modernize uh, their their biggest airport to China and paying for it in oil. Oil and gold are being remonetized and looked at as more valuable than the currencies that purchase them, because they can't be taken away the way that the treasury market can and our weaponization and flat out confiscation of Russian assets to buy weapons to give to the country they're in a war against. That's a, a line you can't cross, but we did. But in any case, what is unique about this is that these countries will all be able to remain autonomous and have their own currency. They will trade using their local currencies over the Embridge, but settle in the common unit settlement currency backed by 40% gold and 60% a basket of currencies in these countries. This is a massive, massive, massive deal. And it mm -hmm. signals really the beginning of the end of the U.S. Treasury being the place where all of the excess reserves go. In fact, you would have no reason if you were any of these countries in the Southern Hemisphere to accumulate treasuries ever again. You would accumulate gold more than anything and currencies within the BRICS framework. But the ability to settle in local in, in or to transact in local currencies, sidestepping SWIFT. By the way, Saudi Arabia has just become a, a um, uh, they were announced by the Bank of International Settlements, they will become a full participant in Project Embridge. So this is something that is growing and growing and growing and gives these people the ability to trade outside the SWIFT using their local currencies and then settling in a, in a common settlement currency of uh, that will be called the unit that will be backed by gold, will not be rehypothecated, and evidently will be redeemable in kilo bars um, and a basket of 60% in currencies. This is This is a very, 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 very big deal. And when you see Saudi Arabia decide to not re-up the exclusivity deal with the U.S., in essence, to be able to trade in local currencies if they want, and then settle in the in the unit. Um, in fact, the unit, um, the, the president of the Brixton Development Bank was so enamored with it that they are having a, a special meeting in, in China in September to discuss this one month before the BRICS meeting. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's real, it's happening, it's accelerating, and... Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting way of looking at it in that um, these countries will be able to remain autonomous with their own currencies, but have to be responsible with them and then settle in a, in a currency or a common settlement currency that will really wreak havoc not only on the settlement status of the dollar, but also the reserve status of the treasury. 
Yeah, absolutely. Very well said, as always. And I don't know if you saw, Andy, I think it was about a week ago, we put on our telegram if that meaning you're referring to. Uh, the finance ministers or the, or the representatives, I'm not sure which, but they were burning dollars on live TV. I mean, it was what a compelling, you know. I didn't see that, but, you know, yeah. it, I think that 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 visualization speaks a lot. And I think it, yeah. it, 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 it tells you the way that they're thinking. And the weaponization of the dollar, the confiscation of Russian assets, this is a line that uh, once crossed, it's very difficult to come back from. Completely. And as, we're, as, all, as usual, we're tracking beautifully on our mindset because you beat me to the punch on the, the question I was going to ask you. You were talking about the unit settlement, which kind of tied into the previous question. So it made sense. Because um, you remember I sent you that article about what Putin is doing with respect to Vietnam and the unit of 40% gold, 30% Russian bonds, Chinese bonds, which yeah. est ostensibly is is gold, right? I mean, it's yes, just a different absolutely. derivation. It's the way I look at it, and I'd love to get your your viewpoint of it is if if you had a business, let's say, whatever that widget would be, and you had three investors and one investor says, I'll put up 40%, somebody says, I'll put 30, I'll put 30, and they buy. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I think it is very much. Absolutely. 100%. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, so you mentioned the COMEX. I did have a question about that, Andy. Um, what do you think will happen first? Will the COMEX and the LMBA run out of gold and silver and allow the free market to set the price? Or do you think there'll be some kind of financial crisis or a depression that will force investors to seek safety of gold and silver that will inevitably make the physical metal soar to all-time highs? Well, I think there's a there is a realization right now that the LBMA and the COMEX are running out of metal. And mm -hmm. I think you can you can see that, right? The central banks are buying at a level the world has never seen. At the same time, you have the Shanghai vaults that are are bled down to an eight and a half year low at about 700 tons or 23 million ounces. And they've been bled down over the last several um, the last several weeks and or months, really since mid-March, um, when I ironically we had four of the Western bullion banks show up there, uh, in particular trying to to get silver because you can't export gold out of there. But since the day they showed up, uh, their silver vaults have, have just been falling and falling and falling. We saw June being a major delivery month on COMEX. We saw over 30,000 contracts stand for delivery um in june i mean at 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 100 ounces a piece that's an awful lot that's 3 million ounces of gold who's got that kind of money standing for delivery and this is something that that i think it will continue to happen and so i don't know look i mean when we talk about the lbma they are trading 20 million ounces of gold per day um, and 2.292 million ounces of silver per day. But they have admitted that the numbers that they post for settlement are as much as 10 times understated. Because if I sell you 10 and buy 20 contracts, the net result is only 10. Instead of 30 traded, they only settle 10. And so if that be the case, you're talking 200 million ounces of, of gold per day that are being traded and as much as 2.9 billion ounces of silver per day. And so they've run into a situation where I think the world understands, the Southern Hemisphere understands that the way that they are able to beat the West is not with missiles, but they can gr massively disrupt the, the big bullion banks, which happen to be the biggest commercial banks on the planet, by playing this game of using the Western suppression, this massive amount of rehypothecation, and stand for delivery, play the game and, and take this ridiculous price that is created through, you know, tremendous leverage by these naked short positions. You know, when you're trading literally three and a half times global mine supply of silver per day, there's a problem. That's just on the LBMA. You have the COMEX in silver that's 1,600% rehypothecated. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this morning or yesterday, silver is trading at $33.44 an ounce in Shanghai. Gold not as acute, but about $23.50 in Shanghai, a, a, a decent spread, but you know, not quite what we're seeing in silver. This arbitrage is siphoning all the metal away from the West, 
and moving it to the east is gradual draining of the of the exchanges is, is is beginning i think to be realized and these countries understand the way to win the game is through methodical slow accumulation using the suppression of the western markets to their advantage against us in standing for delivery and so we are continually seeing these this massive exodus a few weeks ago friday we probably talked about it on your show there was a huge delivery that came out of the comex and went to hong kong and it was uh, 7560 kilo bars of gold 500 million dollars plus in gold again delivered and sent to hong kong brinks because in 2015 the cme group created a contract that allows for delivery of COMEX bars to Brinks Hong Kong, which is now a COMEX facility. And it's telling that they only bought the kilo bars, which are part of the mini contracts on COMEX. Typically COMEX deals in hundred ounce bars, but what does deal in kilo bars is the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So here again, you'll get these banks or these big funds, sovereign wealth funds that will use the Western suppression against us. Heck, they probably even short it in on Colmex and then stand for delivery in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and then truck it right over to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, where it's then fed out to the rest of the world, where, where countries like Iran can sell their oil to China for yuan, which is then immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. You see, they're using the suppression against us and they are draining the exchanges. These markets never really were designed to deliver, but they have that feature. So that's what they're doing. And you're seeing it where, you know, you're getting 3 million ounces of gold that were, was taken uh, this week or this month for the June delivery contract. And well, let's see, what is 7,560 divided by 32.15 or times 32.15? It's 243,000 ounces. You know, you're talking a tremendous amount of gold. Who's got that kind of money? And so that's what these countries are doing. So I don't know when it ends or what breaks first, but I would say by the, the massive deliveries that we're seeing coming off of the Western exchanges and going eastward, it's, it's in progress. And it's not a good trend, that's for sure. One way or the other, the whole system breaks and will will move at some point to the Moscow exchange, to the Shanghai exchange, which, by the way, over the last 75 days, the combined volume in the Shanghai futures and the Shanghai gold exchange, it's up 200 percent. And it's it's surpassed that of the COMEX, making it effectively the second most active precious metals commodity exchange on the planet behind the LBMA. This is not something to be taken lightly. And, mm. and so you are seeing, I think it will be a drive when this is finally exposed. You know, they already know it. They just haven't exposed it publicly yet because they're using it to drain the exchanges. But when it is exposed, you'll see the, the market in Dubai, the, the, the metals market in Dubai, in Shanghai, in Moscow, in other parts of the world will take over for what is the rehypothecated, in essence, fractionally reserved Ponzi scheme of the COMEX and the LBMA. So we're not there yet, John, but we're on a pathway to getting there, if you ask me. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely a form of financial leverage. And on the flip side, Andy, as, I, as you were talking, I was thinking here in America, Texas is, is starting to talk about trying to create their own stock exchange to divorce away from the system. So you have this, you know, veritable pulling apart, right, on both sides. Absolutely. Um, Next question I want to ask you, Andy, is I get the feeling that a country like China, we were talking about them, uh, suddenly announced that they were going to do a type of gold-backed currency. It might be tantamount to a declaration of war. I mean, look at what has happened with Muammar Gaddafi when he threatened to take Libya back to a gold standard. Uh, you see what how you see Saudi Arabia, you see Oman, you see Kuwait, how they're thriving, right, without U.S. militia suppression, without a proxy government, they're completely freed up. Do you think other countries are looking at doing that and being cautious before they move forward with a currency that will upstage the dollar? Of course. Well, that's why they're finding safety in num numbers with the BRICS. And if, you, if I admire anything about the BRICS is that the way that they are doing it is methodical and, and very slow. 
And but when you realize that 59 countries come out of this meeting in 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 Russia last week, saying 59 countries are are planning on or have formally applied to or will join the BRICS, you're talking a massive unity, a massive group that is bigger in, in just about every way, human population, GDP, mm -hmm. production of, of commodities from rare earths to, to precious metals. The Chinese bought the, the LME, which is the London Metals Exchange, which has all the base metals. They're striking deals all around the world, and in particular in, in underdeveloped nations like Africa and South America, industrializing all of their commodities. Uh, they, they talked about at this meeting that countries not only resource rich, but those that have um, strategic transport routes in, in both on land and sea routes would be a big part of those that would be admitted into the BRICS. You're talking three of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet, you know, a larger sw swath of human population by a large degree. And when you add in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union, where we're hearing every day these countries or these organizations will join the BRICS, I've been saying that for three years, you know, Saudi Arabia has applied to the SCO, Iran has or has been admitted. You're talking some very formidable people, some very formidable countries, strength in every way, population, GDP, military might, and commodities and shipping lanes. They're doing it methodically. And this is why they have not been in a massive rush to issue these common settlement currencies, because if you only have right now 10 countries involved, you only have nine other countries that you can do business with or go shopping in. But if it's 59, now your common settlement uh, unit, you'll be able to use it in 59 countries or 69 countries. What if it's 100? So they are doing it the right way. And I think indeed it is coming. But what we see is that in and of itself, these countries forever haven't had the wherewithal, the sophistication, the wealth, or the courage to stand on their own and break free. Now they, I think, are finding this safety in numbers. And you see all of these military agreements that are being signed. Um, this, is, this is a trend in motion. So there will come a point where you have critical mass, where these countries will be emboldened by just the number of countries that have joined on. And when you realize like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the largest regional financial and military organization on the planet, these are entities that should not be taken lightly. To underestimate these countries is very foolish. The recency and dollar bias, the recency bias, the, the um, normalcy bias with the dollar is foolish. And it's the little by little by little by little this logarithmic decay that it takes so long and, and, and it doesn't show anything meaningful unless you're really looking hard. I see tremendous meaning in all of the things that have happened, but watching the Western media, you would think this is a nothing burger. <laughs> um, and I think that is a big mistake. That, that underestimation is a critical mistake. And, you know, everyone talks about the strength of the U S treasury market, but who wants to buy our treasuries that can be, inflated, defaulted, confiscated, and, uh, and, and you know, and instead what these countries are doing, they're buying commodities. This is Bretton Woods 3. It's no longer about debt opaque or, or opaque debt instruments. It's about who's got all the commodities. And, and this union is becoming very real. So don't know how it all plays out, but I would watch closely the BRICS meeting in October and just see how many of these other 59 countries are actually admitted into what is a very, very, very growing, formidable group um, that I think people need to keep an eye on and, and do not underestimate the significance of it. They're slow and methodical, and people in this country have grown accustomed to, to you know, massive moves very, very quickly where instant gratification isn't fast enough. But that's, again, being used to their advantage. Um, Everyone is ignoring just how big this is because it's not moving fast enough. And the Western media doesn't do a poor job of telling us what's happening. They do no job. Yeah. I'm reading websites all around the world every single day to find this information. The West has done a deplorable job of getting people ready to get out of the way of what's coming. And, and the problem is none of them see what's coming and you can't get out of the way of what you don't see coming.
As beautifully said, as always, we're tracking and synchronizing well, Andy, because uh, that was kind of my my same mindset on the whole thing. And, and you know, you you mentioned it uh, in October. They have a massive event where I understand there's going to be about 100 countries there. So now we go from 60 to 100, which is obviously a 40 percent increase. And they're formidable countries, as you said. And if you look at the population density, it's well over 60 percent of the world's population. Yeah. So you, you really can't ignore it. And obviously, you and I both know, I think we can say this on camera as well as off that, you know, the fake news is just lying to people because they don't have an interest in the American population being protected. It's in their best interest not to tell the truth, which is why, you know, patriots like us uh, are trying to encourage people to become their own central bank and hedge against that. Right. We've said that many times before. So this is a good uh, I think a good segue question, Andy, to maybe wrap up today. And, and a good uh, touch point about one of the many hallmarks and strengths of Miles Franklin, respectively, which is this. Um, one of the concerns we have with vaulting gold has always been that our government, speaking of which, or any government for that matter, what jurisdiction that might be in could come in by force and confiscate the metals. Another concern is, did the vaulting company really set aside the gold and silver, meaning do they have it? Um, do 50 other people own the same gold and silver? In a crisis, would you be able to even get to or access it directly? Um, I believe that my belief is that uh, you only own the gold and silver that's housed in your possession, what you can physically get to. So, with that in mind, can you articulate, Andy, about how your vaulting system works at Miles Franklin specifically? Yeah, first of all, I don't think we'll see confiscation like you see behind me the picture of Roosevelt. The $20 gold piece, and those are all four 20. Uh, there's a, a 10, a 20, a 50, and a $100 gold certificate. By the way, those certificates, instead of saying, God, we trust, say payable to the bearer on demand in gold coin. But in 33, it was easier to confiscate gold. You had a, a far greater sense of, of patriotism, uh, and everyone owned gold. Everybody owned gold because it was it was currency. And now, you know, you're talking half a percent allocation to the whole financial matrix from Joe and Jane six pack to the Harvard Endowment Fund. The, the consequences, whether intended or unintended, would be voracious. I think if our creditors feared that type of nationalization of assets like in Venezuela, it's game over to the nth degree. We have bigger problems to worry about. And so I don't think they will. And it's ironic that you look at HSBC Bank as the custodian of GLD, the third or fourth largest stockpile of gold in the world. They're maybe the most crooked bank in the world, at least in terms of fines that they've paid over the years for you know, LIBOR fixing or dealing with the drug money out of South, South America or all of these issues that they've paid massive fines for. They're the custodian of, of GLD and even more atrocious J.P. Morgan, who paid a $920 million fine to the Justice Department for manipulating the silver market, is still allowed to be the custodian of the world's largest silver trust, the largest stockpile of silver in the world, SLV, and they in BlackRock. So they could come in on a Friday night and take those two funds, SLV, the largest stockpile of silver, GLD, the third or fourth largest stockpile of gold held by the crooked cartel banks that manipulate the price anyway, um, and say what? We didn't do anything. We just closed those two funds. We didn't break laws or infringe any civil liberties. You can still own physical gold. So I think it's a way for them to have their cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. But as far as our vaults are concerned, this is why I work with Brinks, John, and, and I, you know, I, I have a third party. Everything is audited um, by independent auditors. Everything is segregated 100% in the name of the customer. Uh, there is no rehypothecation, and this is why I chose Brinks. They are very regimented. They are very, very by the book. So I think it's very important that if you're going to trust a depository to hold your metal, it's one that has a great track record and one that does it in a very, very 100% um, uh, transparent and segregated manner. So yeah, um, in 16 years, I've never seen an ounce of gold or silver out of place in, in my relationship, which is 16 years long with Brinks Global Services in our vaults in, let's see, we've got Montreal, which was our first, Toronto, Vancouver, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, soon to be Dallas, New York City, and Miami. <laughs> and um, we have worldwide exclusives with Brinks that no one else has, in particular, the only fixed rate program in North America. 
where it's based on the number of ounces that you hold, not by its value. So yeah, I'm I am very enamored with with our storage program. In fact, I think we're the envy of the storage industry. But you never, ever, ever store in allocated fashion, only segregated. Allocated is pooled. Segregated is in your name 100%. And that's the only way that we would ever do it. So while there is truth to having something in your own possession being the best way, because what gold and silver represent, John, are assets that are not simultaneously anyone else's liability. And that's a hard thing to come by these days. So I think there's a lot to be said for physical ownership. But if that doesn't work, then I have never had any reason ever uh, to look cross at, um, at Brinks. So in a world of imperfect choices, they're, in my mind, as good as it gets. Yeah, and, and I agree, because years ago, I looked into Brinks for prior to our relationship, looking at uh, offsite storage and you know viable possibilities. And you know, Brinks is very very measured and methodical to your point and very um, accountable from end to end touch points and of course security and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you see them at banks and you know that's a small portion of their business. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, obviously it depends on the customer, but generally speaking, do you recommend uh, a kind of a split between segregated uh, vaulting and uh, personal ownership in one's domicile? I mean, if, if you lived on a ranch, or a farm or enough 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 space to hold mm -hmm. it yourself, that's always the best choice. Um, the minute you start to be concerned, yeah, I think then, you know, really the issue is this, you could have a million dollars worth of gold in a backpack and sprint to the car. It wouldn't be that big of a deal. You know, it's gonna be heavy, but not that heavy. Um, you're talking 30-ish pounds. And, but a million dollars in silver is going to weigh, you know, um, a lot over a thousand pounds. So you end up in a situation where logistics become an issue, but yeah, if you're not able to safely hold it and not, you know, lose peace of mind or sleep at night because of what you have under your roof, then I would suggest storage. But short of that, yeah. I mean, if you can hold it yourself, you have no counterparty risk. I think you have a better chance of being ripped off by the system and not by Brinks, but just by the system. Yeah. Then you do buy a would be burglar, knowing that you're a midnight gardener and you're digging holes in, in middle of the night in your backyard and burying stuff, which a lot of people do, believe it or not. And um, yeah, I mean, if you can hold it yourself, do. If not, I think we have the finest storage program in America. And I'm dead serious on that for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, we're coming to the end of it. And as you know, Miles Franklin is one of our most trusted affiliate partners and sponsors. And uh, it's the place where I uh, trust them to work with uh, gold and silver myself, uh, newsmatic coins, rec collectibles, 401k IRA conversions, because again, we're not financial advisors. This is not constitutes financial advice, but I've held 401ks and IRAs and I've liquidated them with success. And uh, Miles Franklin is one of the best in the industry in being able to safely convert that for you and get you the maximum amount of return possible to hedge against, as he just said, the system. So um, they have my stamp of approval for whatever that's worth to you. And if you do have any questions, you can feel free to give Miles Franklin a call. And uh, Andy, I'll turn that over to you for information and final thoughts that you have for the audience today. Yeah, I, the best way to reach us would be for now, send an email you know, and say, um, John Dowling sent me to info at milesfranklin.com and where you will find um, where you can request our price list for your listeners, John, that that will be as good or better than anywhere in North America. We keep it close to the vest. It's not published. Um, any questions that you've heard on this show, questions on IRAs, like you said, or storage or any of those things, info at Miles Franklin and um we would be honored to to work with your listeners. We've never had a complaint in 24 years. Excuse me, 34 years. Gosh, it's been a long time. Yeah. 34 years, going on 35. And I'll make sure your listeners are not the first. I guess, sure. you know, my, my final thoughts would be that I have a very hard time believing that as we head into what amounts to the biggest election of our of our lifetime. Uh, this massive meeting with the BRICS in October, 
that it will be smooth sailing. I have a hard time believing that. I think things are going to start to accelerate. I think things are going to start to get very interesting. You can feel things beginning to accelerate geopolitically, politically, spiritually, morally, the way that things are happening, in, you know, societal. Mm. Um, I think it's never been more important than ever to be a contrarian. In fact, I would say if you're not a contrarian, you're damn well doomed to be a victim. Um, so I, I think now is the time to to protect yourself, like a hurricane is coming, uh, both a financial and a literal one. It's not just about having gold and silver, which I view as money, as wealth, but it's about having all of your ducks in order, be prepared, food and water and, and home protection and and you know batteries and, and dog food and all of these things that you would need because what I really see happening with all of this, John, is a contraction in credit. Mm -hmm. You got banks on the edge, you got all of this entire system on the edge. You got collapsing commercial real estate. Banks are reeling in credit. And just as expansive and bullish as this massive boom in credit and easy money, low interest rates, $6 trillion dumped on the system in a short period of time, a trillion in debt being added every 100 days, just as expansive and bullish as that was, the contraction of credit, the rising of rates, the slowing of the economy, I think will be exponentially more bearish. You look at the Russell 2000 right now, or even the S&P 500, you got three stocks holding the whole dang thing up. The mm -hmm. Russell 2000, which is a, a broad indication of the stock uh, of the economy, it, they're all collapsing. So the economy, which they want us to believe is the stock market is completely detached from the stock market. And I have a hard time believing that we see smooth sailing Heading into November, I think more than ever, it's not about return on your money, it's return of it. So um, we'd love to work with your listeners. And um, I really appreciate these shows. And I look forward to riding shotgun with you over the next several weeks into what I honestly believe will be the most interesting time of my career. And let's not forget the Chinese do have a curse. May you live in interesting times. John, I think these will be anything but dull and complacent. And uh, well, let's just start it interesting and, and see where it goes from there. To say the least, Andy, it's very biblical as well. Andy Shackman, CEO of Miles Franklin and fellow uh, affiliate member, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to having you again uh, shortly. I appreciate you, brother. I look forward to that too. Hope you and everyone else stays well. God bless.